Hello and welcome. Nigeria cannot afford a war. Vice President Oshibajo challenges the nation's elite to speak up against divisive forces to preserve the country's unity. Two of the students abducted from the Federal University of Agriculture, Makudi Benue State, regain their freedom after two days in captivity. INEC chairman joins call for speedy passage of Electoral Act Amendment Bill, stresses need for new legal framework for the conduct of the 2023 general elections. And hospitals overwhelmed as India's death toll from COVID-19 tops 200,000. Plus we'll have business, sports, news from Abuja and later on international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Debt Management Office seeks enactment of debt laws for state governments in order to curb Nigeria's increasing debt profile. On sports news tonight, Tokyo Olympics Organizing Committee announces that athletes and their close contacts will have daily COVID-19 tests at the summer's games. And from Abuja, Federal Executive Council approves new policy strategy to address worsening poverty level in the country. Frank words of hope, possible solutions and ideas are gradually springing up from all quarters on the possible ways to stem the tide of violence and bloodletting threatening the unity of the Nigerian nation. Today, the Vice President asked the elite in the country to rise up and speak against the truth, that's the forces of division in the country, in order to preserve the nation's unity. And without mincing words, Professor Shibajo affirmed that Nigeria cannot afford a war. He made the comments in Abuja while speaking with the All Progressives Congress leaders from the Southeast, particularly chieftains and members from Anambra State. In his words, we cannot afford a war in this country. It is the political elite that will determine what will take place. If we keep quiet, if we say nothing and hope that things will just normalize, we may be wrong. And we may find ourselves heading for something much worse than we're seeing today. Professor Oshibajo further explains that every civil conflict in the country is as a result of elite failure and the failure of the elite to speak up and tell the truth to their communities. He adds, the thing about the kind of conflict in this part of the world is that it usually is a war without end. Everyone who thinks that they have money stored up somewhere is wrong. You will eventually run out. Everyone who thinks that they can go and hide somewhere, you won't even find a place. In the end, everyone will suffer. Parents, children, young people and old people will suffer. Professor Oshibajo recalls a personal experience he observed in Somalia in the 90s when he went there to work with the United Nations. The Vice President said he saw a Supreme Court Justice, whom he had known before, queuing up for food in the aftermath of civil conflicts in the country. Party chieftains present at the meeting include former Senate President Ken Namani, Minister of State for Mines and Steel Development Uche Oga, Minister of State for Labour and Productivity, other party leaders and members from the South East and the Special Advisor to the President on Political Matters, among others. And for the third day running, the House of Representatives has been holding frank conversations on the security situation in the country. Today, the lawmakers took the move up a notch with the inauguration of a 40-member committee on a security summit which it plans to hold in May. The committee is expected to come up with solutions to the rising insecurity in the country as the speaker, Femi Bajabia Miller, maintains that there is a clear and urgent need to take necessary action against different arms and levels of government to address the crisis. The planned summit is expected to be open to the public. We'll set up this committee to begin to look into ways on how to address and tackle the situation where we find ourselves. And it is in the context of these prevailing realities that the House of Representatives has appointed this special committee to undertake a comprehensive study of the issues and challenges of our national security from the perspective of the legislature. 
and at the end of it, recommend innovative practical solutions that can help to relieve us of our present national security and challenges. There is therefore a clear and urgent need to take all necessary actions across the different arms and levels of government to articulate solutions to ensure an effective response to the challenges we face. In doing this, we must recognize the need to proceed with caution and wisdom so that as we respond to existing problems, we do, further, we do not further compound them or create new difficulties. For Governor Dave Umahi of Ebonyi State, who is also the chairman of the Southeast Governors Forum, opinion leaders, particularly religious and traditional frontrunners, need to come together and find solutions to the country's security challenges. Governor Umahi believes that for the country to come out of this current challenge, leaders must participate in the meetings that will lead to concrete outcomes to ensure a peaceful atmosphere in Nigeria. The governor also urged leaders across the country to be mindful of their utterances, which, according to him, are capable of stoking the crisis. We have uh, the activities of uh, some, you know, youths down in Southeast that are agitating for fair treatment, equity and fairness. And uh, when you listen to them, at the beginning where there was no violence, do they have some merits? In what they are saying, yes, the answer is yes, but the method is wrong. You can't be looking for your rights and you're insulting a sitting president, you are insulting the leaders even from other regions, you are insulting your own people. And that's when the agitation was agitation. Along the line, criminals have hijacked it. And so, in every state, there ought to be selection of two religious leaders. Maybe one traditional ruler. Let all of them in all the states go and gather together and get the former heads of uh, states to work with them. Mr. President is a good man. He means well for the nation. You can castigate him if you don't know the man. This is my own little state. Is it easy for me? The answer is no. If we want to solve the security problems, not just security men and the president, every one of us. A former president of Nigeria wants everyone to know that he is an incurable optimist of Nigeria's unity. And that's Chief Olushegun Obasanjo, who says, though the call for Nigeria's breakup might be loud, it will never be heard. The former president made these comments at the Baptist Convention in Ogun State, where the governors of Ogun and Oyo states also called for peace and an end to violence. The occasion might be to celebrate the 108th edition of the Nigerian Baptist Annual Convention and the retirement of the president of the Christian Association of Nigeria. But the presence of political figures like a former president and two governors heightens expectations that comments of national importance will be made. The speeches are geared at maintaining peace in the country. This, as the governor of Oyo State, Shehimakide, puts it, is the charge placed on the leaders by the people. This is indeed a trying period for us as a country. There is restlessness all over the place. We also have economic difficulties. We are faced with economic challenges. But as your government and your representative, we will not be deterred. Living together in peace and unity is the only way the nation can survive. And the Ogun State Governor, Dakwa Biodum, calls on Nigerians to shun all forms of violence. Most importantly, we must reject the violence. We must reject the violence. We must reject the violence. We must pursue peace with one another. We must pursue peace with one another. Former President Olusha Gombasan just comment is short but reassuring. I am an incurable optimist about a number of things, but particularly about Nigeria. 
In the face of challenges, positive conversation and proclamations about the nation may be useful in changing the mindset of negativity in the country. Two of the students kidnapped from the Federal University of Agriculture, Makudid Benue State, have been released by their abductors. A statement from the school says the students Israel Kwage and Solomon Salihu returned to campus on Tuesday. Police authorities say the victims were returned unhurt, but there was no mention of the third student who was also reportedly abducted on the same day. It's also unclear if a ransom was paid before the students were freed. The three students of the Federal University of Agriculture, Makudi, were abducted from their school by gunmen on Monday. And the story is different in Kaduna State, where the body of one of the 23 abducted students of Greenfield University, who was killed by bandits a few days ago, has been laid to rest. The emotional internment service for Miss Dorothy Johanna held a missed calls for the president to immediately end the incessant killings across the country. The Equa Church in Narai area of Chikun Local Government Council of Kaduna State played host to family members, friends and colleagues of Dorothy Johanna, who was one of the abducted students of Greenfield University in Kasarami village along Abuja Kaduna Expressway. They have come to pay their last respect to Dorothy, whose lifeless body, along with two other colleagues of hers, three days after at a village after they were abducted from their school on April the 20th, 2021. In keeping with the dictates of a solemn gathering, him is rendered. When it's time for the sermon, Reverend Samuel Atu calls on those in authority to do something about the security situation in the country before it spins out of control. How many more your lives do we need to bury before Buhari wakes up from his sleep? It is with heavy heart. And I have no apology. We don't deserve this as a country. If Buhari cannot do it, he should humbly step aside. The management of Greenfield University is represented by the vice chancellor of the institution. He pays his last respect and also offers the university's condolences to Dorothy's family. For about 20 years that I've been teaching in the university, have not experienced this kind of despondency, the distress, the stress, and the challenge. But it is why, because as it is written here, our hope of glory is in Christ. And I'm trusting God that God will perfect all that concerns us and the family in the name of Jesus. Taking the incident in his stride, Dorothy's father describes her death and that of many others as a sacrifice to make, but he is also asking those responsible for securing the nation to walk the talk. Government should be more proactive to help the situation. Government should be proactive. They should not just keep quiet. They should be proactive to help the situation because it's getting out of hand. Over, Harry Mains has moved from the church auditorium into a waiting hearse for the final journey. Our thoughts and prayers remain with her family. In part two, after the break, INEC asks National Assembly to quickly pass the Electoral Act, plus a bill to create additional special seats for women in federal and state legislative houses passes second reading in the House of Representatives. The join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Nigeria cannot afford a war. Vice President Oshibaju challenges the nation's elite to speak up against divisive forces to preserve the country's unity. Two of the students abducted from the Federal University of Agriculture, Makudi Benue State, regain freedom 
after two days in captivity. INEC Chairman joins call for speedy passage of Electoral Act Amendment Bill, stresses need for a new legal framework for the conduct of the 2023 general elections. And hospitals overwhelmed as India's death toll from COVID-19 tops 200,000. A day after a coalition of civil society organizations renewed pressure on the National Assembly to accelerate the processes of creating a new electoral act before the next general election, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, is also making this demand. Professor Yakubu says INEC is anxious to know the legal framework that will guide the conduct of the 2023 general elections. He was speaking at a public hearing on the Electoral Offences Commission bill. Our correspondent Linda Akigbe reports. This is a public hearing by the Senate Committee on INEC to get feedback from professionals on the Electoral Offences Commission bill. The Electoral Offences Commission bill provides for the creation of an organization tasked with the responsibility of investigating and prosecuting electoral offenders. Adopt measures to prevent, minimize and eradicate electoral offenses. INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, while supporting the Electoral Offences Commission bill, is seeking quick passage of the Electoral Act. Senate President Ahmed Lawan had assured that the Electoral Act Amendment Bill would be passed by the end of the first quarter of 2021, but the National Assembly has failed to meet this target. While we are excited by today's public hearing, I would like to reiterate our appeal to the National Assembly for the expeditious passage of the Electoral Offences Commission Bill and the pending review of the electoral legal framework generally. We are confident that NAS will conclude work on the legal framework in earnest. Number two, 2019 Amendment B. Meanwhile, the Senate is amending the law setting up the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON, to strengthen it to tackle the problem of toxic loons. The amendment bill empowers AMCON to, among others, take possession, manage or sell all properties traced to debtors, whether or not such assets or property is used as security or collateral for obtaining the loan in particular. However, some lawmakers fault this clause. If I'm a debtor and I tender a collateral for a facility with the original bank, I have signed everything that has to do with that, that collateral. You cannot go beyond the context of, of, of that collateral, Mr. President. Nevertheless, the Senate passes the bill. And the bill is passed. Leader of the Senate. Speaking to Channel's television, one of the sponsors of the bill explains that the amendment will strengthen AMCON in access recovery. Most of these debtors, like I said, they are flying with private jets in this country. They have assets across the country, yet they are refusing to pay the money. So with this current amendment, now Amcon can look at their other asset and now use it to recover the loans by taking over those assets. The amendment also gives Amcon the power to approach credit tribunals to recover their funds, eliminating the bottlenecks often encountered in normal courts. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. Women representation and inclusiveness in Nigeria's politics is getting more attention, this time from the National Assembly, where a bill for an act to alter the provisions of the Constitution to create additional space and special seats for women in the federal and state's legislative houses has scaled second reading. The bill, which was sponsored by the Deputy Majority Whip and 85 other lawmakers, seeks to address the issue of low representation of women in the legislature, our correspondent Terry Kumi reports. Ahead of the Constitution review by the National Assembly, there have been repeated calls for amendments which will encourage women participation in politics. To, create additional special seats to further push the amendment, the Deputy Minority Whip of the House of Representatives and 85 others have sponsored a bill to create additional special seats for women in the National Assembly and State Houses of Assembly. 
The bill proposes two additional members of the House of Representatives from each state and the federal capital territory who shall be women, and one additional senator from each state and the federal capital territory who shall be a woman. Also concerns that the situation is worse at the state houses of assembly level, where a good number of states do not have a single woman in their state assembly. The House has proposed a new Section 91, which states that a House of Assembly of a state shall consist of three or four times the number of seats which that state has in the House of Representatives, and one additional member from each of the three senatorial districts in the state who shall be a woman. The bill is unanimously supported by the lawmakers. Meanwhile, speaking to journalists after plenary, the lead sponsor of the bill highlights some of its major intendments. Other countries have made this concerted effort to think outside the box. How will it work? And I believe that this is the only way to work in this country because you have a lot of people that you agree with something on principle and then the next day people talk to them and they change their mind. So, but it is law and I can tell you that the president has directed the um, some ministers to lodge with parliament to see that women are included and so we are loving everybody to make sure that this one passed so the issue of party not being able to feed anybody party head doesn't want to feel a woman but if will feel the lawmakers are proposing that the amendments should commence after the current life of the national assembly and shall be reviewed after 16 years terry ikumi channels television news and staying in the National Assembly, legislative aides today resumed their protest, which was suspended last week after promises by the leadership of the National Assembly. The protesting aides say they met with the clerk two weeks ago and were promised to be paid in two weeks, which elapsed on April the 27th. They insist that the protest will continue until they are paid. The legislative aides are protesting non-payment of salary arrears as far back as 2019, duty to allowance, poor working conditions, among others. And students planning to cheat or engage in any form of malpractices during the forthcoming Unified Tertiary Examinations may need to have a rethink as the Joint Admissions and Matriculations Board, JAM, says it set up what it called rogue centers to catch those seeking special centers where they can be assisted to cheat. The JAM Registrar, Professor Isha Kuluyede, also frowns on the role of some parents who are seeking centers where their wards would be assisted to record high marks in the examination. He adds that the board has taken enough steps to prevent candidates from cheating as it keeps improving its measures to conduct credible examinations. I've not seen any itch. What I've seen is product of indiscipline, particularly on the parts of parents. The parents are not allowing these uh, candidates to breathe. They want to force them to do one particular course or the other. That's why they are... Somebody says, I want to study English. The mother says, he must study law. And the candidate is looking for how to eliminate the mother so that he can tell you the truth, that I want English. So the parents are the problem. When people were going to pay to rogue centers, we also opened rogue centers. We opened rogue centers that if you want to increase your score, Come here and pay 15000 And people are paying. All those who paid, we disqualify them. So are you going to say you open yeah, you, of course, platform. deliberately. That um, if you are cutting corner and you want, to, and we know what they are doing, we will op open our own rogue. You, that's why candidates now, when they want to patronize, say, are you genuine or jump? Away from education, drug peddlers are still facing tough times. The latest culprit is a trans-border trafficker, Emeka Okuru, and another drug dealer, Ibrahim Bello, who were arrested in Abuja by operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency with cocaine weighing 1.1 kilograms with a street value of 264 million naira. While Mr. Okoro was intercepted with 900 grams of cocaine in a commercial bus along Abuja Gwagwalada Road on Monday, April the 26th, based on intelligence, Mr. Bello was nabbed with 200 grams of the illicit drug in Zuba area of the Federal Capital Territory the same day through a controlled delivery operation. 
According to the commander of the agency in the FCT, Ms. Okoro was an intending traveler to Libya through Kano and Agadez in Niger Republic with wraps of cocaine weighing 900 grams, while the other seizure of 200 grams was made following intelligence reports. Meanwhile, the Kogi State Command of the agency has also intercepted and seized 157.5 kilograms of a substance contained in a commercial bus. The NDLEA says the suspect and his consignment were intercepted at a patrol point in Lokoja, and the suspect has confessed that the substance was sourced from Oshun State and he was heading to Nasrawa State. When the news at 10 returns, we have more stories from our Abuja studio, plus debt management office seeks enactment of laws for state governments in order to curb Nigeria's increasing debt profile. And that will be on Business News. Please join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. Let's cross over to Abuja now. And here's Gloria Umezuke. Gloria. Hello, Ijama. Good to see you. The poverty level in the country tops the list of discussions at the Federal Executive Council meeting today. And cabinet members raised deep concerns over its worsening level in the country. A key decision reached is the approval of a new policy strategy to address the menace. The special advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Mr. Femi Adeshino, told State House correspondents that the council meeting presided over by President Muhammadu Buhari also notes efforts to resolve the deteriorating situation. The 43rd Federal Executive Council meeting is presided over by the President Muhammadu Buhari at the First Lady's Conference Room in the State House. Behind closed doors, the worsening poverty levels across the country took precedence. Petroleum resources and the After the meeting, Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity announced the approval of a strategy to urgently proffer solution to the menace. It's not as if government is not aware that there's poverty in the land, but things have been done. And one of it is this national poverty reduction with growth strategy that was presented today. The council also noted that the president had pledged to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. Actually, by June 12th this year, that promise will be two years old. It was noted that it is work in progress, and it is work that will get done. We have a target, 100 million Nigerians in 10 years. This government will do the best it can do up to its terminal date in 2023, and subsequent governments will then continue. Rising poverty levels is apparently not the only concern. Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management is worried about attacks on IDP camps. We are doing our best. We have agencies under the ministry that are mandated to give a first response as well as to support with durable solutions. It's a very worrisome situation that we are all in as a country, not only for the humanitarian ministry. We just hope that we'll see to the end of this uh, situation very soon. The Executive Council also approved 2.1 billion naira for a facility maintenance contract for the Ministry of Petroleum Resources and a national diaspora policy aimed at formalizing relations between the government and the over 17 million Nigerians in the diaspora. A bill to ensure compulsory teaching of vocational studies in secondary schools has skilled second reading in the House of Representatives. The bill, which was sponsored by Representative Joseph Bello, seeks to ensure that students are taught skills at the secondary school level. In supporting the bill, the lawmakers are optimistic that for future purposes, it would address the unemployment crisis in the country.
River State Government has directed civil servants from grade level 01 to 13 to resume work tomorrow, Thursday, April the 29th, after a three-month break to contain the spread of COVID-19. In January, the affected civil servants were instructed by the state government to stay at home following the spike in the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in the state, except those providing essential services. The state head of civil service said in a statement that all the workers are expected to strictly comply with the mandatory protocols of COVID-19 by observing social distance, wear a face mask and use a hand sanitizer as they resume work. The statement also directs all permanent secretaries and heads of extra ministerial offices to monitor and ensure that workers observe the COVID-19 guidelines. So that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Ijoma, in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Gloria. The Lagos State Governor, Babajide Somwolu, has flagged off the construction of the new Massey Street Children's Hospital, rehabilitation of Adeniji, Adili, and other streets on Lagos Island. Governor Somwolu says the proposed new hospital is a seven-story building that will provide secondary integrated care services, complying with international best practices. According to him, 56 roads have been identified for rehabilitation, which will help reduce travel time in the state. The construction of the new Massey Children's Hospital reflects our unwavering determination to bridge all gaps in the health sector, while the reconstruction of the three major roads on Lagos Island demonstrates this administration's commitment to an inclusive and non-discriminatory developmental agenda for the whole of Lagos State. Both projects affirm our commitment to the social contract we signed with Lagosians exactly 700 days ago. We are honored by the trust reposed in us and will continue to seek new opportunities to respond to the infrastructural needs of Lagosians. This government is driven by the desire to build a formidable and an equitable state with productive and unhealthy citizens. From health, we take a look at some business news for the day. Here's Teniola Shobowale. Thanks a lot, Ijoma. The high debt service to revenue ratio is a major concern for the Debt Management Office owing to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Nigeria's public debt profile fueled by increased borrowing amid dwindling revenues. According to the Director General of the DMO, Patience Oniha, there is a need for state governments to domesticate debt laws to enhance implementation of the World Bank Assisted States Fiscal Transparency Program. She was speaking at a workshop organized for state governments on guidelines for legal framework on debt management operations. The first budget that was approved last year, the Appropriation Act, the total borrowing it had was about 1.6 trillion. So when COVID happened, what happened? Two things. You know what affects the federal affects the states as well. Two things. Your revenues. Yes. And we all saw what happened. There were tankers of oil in the high seas with no buyers, countries were offering discounts because refineries were short, uh, businesses were short, countries were on lockdown. So a new budget had to be drawn up. Hmm? And that budget has a borrowing of about over four trillion. Let me put it that way. Hmm? Yes, 4.2, you're right, 4.198. Why? That was because of COVID that same last year. We quickly had to rework the books. Not only because revenues dropped, but now you now suddenly realize you needed hospitals, you needed all kinds of facilities, you needed palliatives for, because of the lockdown, people were shut down. So your expenditure increased while your revenues dropped. Could we have said, no, we won't do anything? You had to do something and without the revenues, it meant you had to borrow. So COVID caused economic slowdown, certainly lower revenues, and it is the duty of government to revive and ensure that the economies are sustained. The absolute size of Nigeria's borrowing, uh, when you compare it 
to the gross domestic product is not high, meaning debt to GDP ratio is not high. What is high is debt service to revenue ratio, and that concerns us. Well, let's take a look at the stock market now. Sentiments at the local equities market today were mixed, with the all share index in the red due to sell off of blue chip stocks and price depreciation in large cap stocks. Well, Layo Adigoke tells us more. Thank you for joining us for the stock market report. It's the midweek trading session and the bear still has a grip on the market. Well, the all share index ended on a negative note, dipping by 1.33% today with 259.5 million units valued at 1.91 billion naira in 3,547 deals. The trio of consolidated Hallmark Insurance PLC, Port Paint, and Royal X led the top gainers counter, while FTN Coco, Nimeth, and International Breweries led the top decliners. Let's take a look at the sectoral performance. The banking sector was down 0.19%. Industrial sector also took a big hit, down 3.55%. Oil and gas sector was saved as it printed a 1.98% gain. It's been two negative sessions so far this week. However, analysts are expecting some volatility to continue in the market. That's it on the Stock Market Report. I'm Layo Adegoki. Thanks a lot, Lyle. Meanwhile, U.S. stocks fell today after the Federal Reserve left interest rates unchanged in its latest policy decision despite strengthening e economy and rising inflation. Well, here are the closing numbers for other global markets. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Ijeoma for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks, Senyola. Still ahead on the news at 10, hospitals overwhelmed as India's death toll from COVID-19 tops 200,000. Plus other international news from our studio in London. Do stay with us. Welcome back. COVID-19 deaths in India have passed 200,000, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. Oxygen supplies remain critically low across the country. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Aid has been arriving in India from around the world as the country's death toll from COVID-19 passes 200,000. People have died waiting for beds as oxygen supplies run low, with the actual number of fatalities thought to be even higher. Pressure is growing on Prime Minister Narendra Modi, with critics accusing him of ignoring scientific warnings ahead of the latest devastating wave, which has seen car parks turned into temporary crematoriums. New Zealand says they'll give around one million New Zealand dollars to the Red Cross for its work in India. Earlier, Singapore sent two plane loads of oxygen cylinders to West Bengal. The European Parliament has ratified the post-Brexit EU-UK trade deal, clearing the final hurdle towards full ratification of the accord. The trade and cooperation agreement has been operating provisionally since January. Lawmakers voted in favour by 660 votes to five, while 32 abstained. The decision was welcomed by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who called it the final step in a long journey. The deal provides the framework for Britain's new relationship with the 27-member union. The White House has announced that the Democrats will pitch a $4 trillion package on child care, education and family leave. I promised the American people that help was on the way. President Joe Biden has called for the most sweeping revamp of U.S. benefits since the 1960s on the eve of his 100th day in office. He has already passed a $2 trillion COVID package. Analysts say that it is the most far-reaching reform of U.S. social safety net since the era of President Lyndon Johnson. 
The United States has ordered non-essential staff to leave its Kabul embassy, citing increasing threats as the reason. The order came two weeks after President Joe Biden announced that the U.S. would leave Afghanistan by September. The acting U.S. ambassador in Kabul said the State Department took the decision in light of increasing violence and threat reports in Kabul. He said the order affected an unspecified relatively small number of employees and that the embassy would remain operational. Eight people have been killed and several others seriously hurt in a fire at an illegal hostel in the Latvian capital of Riga. At least 24 people were evacuated from the burning building, some suffering from burns and smoke inhalation. Riga's mayor said that most of the victims are believed to be foreign tourists and the apartment, located near the main railway station, was within a state building and did not have permission from the authorities to be used as a hostel. The UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, will redistribute to other countries more than a million doses of vaccines meant from the Democratic Republic of Congo so that they don't expire. UNICEF said that the vaccines distributed under the Global COVAX initiative expire on June the 24th, and so far only 1,265 people have received the jab in Congo. About 1.3 million doses out of the 1.7 million doses will now go to other countries, including Senegal, Comoros, Ghana and Angola. Somalia's President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo has backed down from his attempt to extend his tenure for two years. In a broadcast addressed to the nation, he commended the efforts of the Prime Minister and other political leaders and welcomed the statements they issued calling for elections. The term extension had drawn domestic and international pressure after clashes in the capital Mogadishu. Britney Spears has requested to personally address the Los Angeles court dealing with her long-running conservatorship. Spears's father was appointed her conservator in 2008 after she was hospitalized for psychiatric treatment following a widely publicized breakdown. Under the conservatorship, Jamie Spears retains control over all her personal and financial affairs. The singer has previously indicated through lawyers that she no longer wants her father to oversee those affairs. And finally, a call centre consultant from Glasgow has taken the meaning of remote working to a whole new level. Jason Griffin set up a temporary office perched on a porter ledge on a cliff face on the island of Anglesey over the Irish Sea. Well, I sit there on this ledge on the side of a cliff, uh, just showing that remote literally means remote. He said that as long as he has a mobile connection and his laptop, he has everything he needs to work. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Tokyo Olympics Organizing Committee has announced that athletes and their close contacts will have daily COVID-19 tests at this summer's Games. The committee says this is an adjustment that organizers from a previous plan for tests every four days as it tries to hold the sporting event safely. Other rules for Olympic participants include a ban on the use of public transport and avoiding restaurants. Four stadiums will be very difficult as a decision on how many domestic fans can attend was pushed back until the month of June. Super Falcons forward Francisca Odega has signed for Spanish women football club Levante Femino on a two-year deal. Odega, who previously played for Atletico Madrid, will have an additional season based on her performance. Odega has also played for Bielsa Queens and Rivers Angels in Nigeria and outside Nigeria in Russia, Sweden, Australia and China. Manchester City FC produced a superb display to come from behind and take control of their UEFA Champions League semi-final with a 2-1 win over Paris Saint-Germain in France. PSG took the lead in 15 minutes from Marquinhos' header and dominated the game for a while. However, Man City clawed, back, or clawed their way back into the game in the 64th minute with a goal from Kevin De Bruyne with Riyad Mahrez putting the icing on the cake. And Wales manager Ryan Giggs denied charges of assaulting two women and controlling or coercive behaviour as he appeared in court on Wednesday. Giggs pleaded not guilty to an allegation he was violent towards his former girlfriend, abused during a 13-minute hearing at the Mag Manchester Magistrates Court. And that sports news is back to you, John.
Thanks, Ayal Shunde. And the main news again. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Shibajo, says Nigeria cannot afford a war as he challenged the nation's elite to speak up against divisive forces to preserve the country's unity. He also asked them to speak the truth to communities. Also today, two of the students abducted from the Federal University of Agriculture, Makudi, in Benue State, regained their freedom after two days in captivity. And hospitals in India were overwhelmed today as the death toll from the COVID-19 tops 200,000. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Do you have a good night and stay safe as well.